5. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke, the fifth chapter. I'm amazed at how many times I read Scripture and uh, I see something else. It's, it's like, it's like uh, you read your Bible. I, I remember, I'll never forget a time that I, my dad was kind of struggling with me because I, when I got saved, I was such a radical. And my dad walked over and handed me a Bible and said, here, I read it. Now leave me alone. <laughs> Kitty, hand me the Bible. Here, I read it. Now leave me alone. It ain't about reading this book once. This book's alive, and it will meet you where you're at. It, it's a, it just uh, blows me away. So are you comfortable? Luke chapter 5, verse 1. This is the first time in Scripture we find Jesus hanging out on the water. Now, this is important to, to me because I was talking with my pastor coming here, and it just, it just hit me. Well, I mean, he just came all over me. That, and I asked him, I said, what's the biggest lake where you live? He said, well, it's Wren Lake up here in Illinois. I said, Pastor, I, I'm going to ask you a question. In, in the end of the Gospels, this is the beginning with, with Jesus and uh, let's see if I got it right, David, and Peter and James and John, right? And then at the end of the Gospel, Peter, uh, when after the crucifixion, Jesus goes, uh, after he dies and resurrects, the disciples go back fishing. You know the story. They go back fishing. And then Jesus ends up on the lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee, uh, from here to Marie, in the back of the building, from here to Marie, in the back, of about 100 yards, okay? He ends up cooking breakfast. And they've been out fishing all night and ain't caught nothing. Just like what this passage I'm fixing to go to, right? Fish all night. And Jesus ends up at a spot in the morning, a hundred yards from where they're at. Geographically, that is impossible. Are you hearing me? Jesus is on a mountain, pushes the disciples out into the water, tells them to go to the other side. He's done fed 15,000 people with a little boy's sack lunch. And then at three o'clock in the morning, he, he goes walking on the water. All right? In the waves, in the dark. And just happens, happens to pass by the boat where the disciples are struggling and they feel like they're fixing to go wander. Can I tell you something? He knows where you're at when you're in distress. And he'll make breakfast. He's got more breakfast than you got breakdowns. <laughs> I said, he got more breakfast than you got breakdowns. He just made them breakfast. And I know y'all breaking down out there. Y'all struggling. Come on over here and have breakfast with me. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. Matthew 5, uh, Luke 5. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that'd be Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Who's in the boat? Who else? Who in the boat? It's just one of them here. Y'all got to help me. Who in the boat? Peter and Jesus. All right. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Peter answered, Master, we worked hard all night, haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught so much, such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. They signaled their partners, James and John, and the other boats to come help them, and they came filled their boats so full that they began to sink. Simon Peter saw this. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go, get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you'll catch men. They pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, followed him. Father, thank you for your word, your anointing, your revelation. Give us understanding today. I love you. Jesus' name, amen.
You can be seated. Last night I preached this message in my sleep. Couldn't shut up. I would wake up thinking about this message. I want you to look at your Bibles again. Sister Cheryl, if you'd go back in to say, let's somewhere around verse 4 and 5. Somewhere around there. Can you find that for me? There you go. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep. See that? And he let down the nets for a catch. So I'm thinking here, Pastor David, that they pulled out just a little bit further, backed up a little bit further. They went to shallow speaking. He backed up a little bit further into the deep. Verse 5, Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night. Now he's trying to talk him out of because he's washed their nets. He's cleaned his gun. Don't shoot the shotgun again after you cleaned it. I just cleaned it. No, I ain't shooting it again. I just cleaned it. Oh, no, I hadn't caught anything, but because you say so, I let down the nest. But, you know, so there's an obedience here. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Okay. Who's in the boat? Say it. Who's in the boat? Peter. And who else? Peter. Don't miss it. Who's in the boat? Jesus. Peter and? Jesus. Peter and? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, they in the boat. Next verse. Simon answer. No, no, no. Go back. Back, back. Simon, back. okay, I'm sorry. My bad. Keep going. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. I want you to see the word they. Who's they? All my gospel life, I have seen Jesus sitting in the boat while Peter threw the net and Peter was struggling to get the net out of the water. Then I saw the word they. And it hit me. Who's in the boat? So evidently, Peter ain't pulling on the net by himself. Evidently, Peter didn't throw the net by himself. Evidently, Jesus helped Peter throw the net into the water. Jesus helped Peter pull the net. And then I'm seeing him laughing. The net is fit. They fished all night. Ain't caught a cotton picking thing. They're fishermen. They're professionals. Amen. Ain't caught nothing. And here's this rookie by the name of Jesus who's sitting in the boat and said, cast it on the right side. They cast it on the right side. And when they cast it on the right side of the boat, amen, sometimes you got to get on the right side. Some of y'all been on the left too long. Come on, Jesus. So he threw it on the right side of the boat. And when they did, it began to fill up. And Jesus sat there holding on to the net. Peter's holding on to the net. And he realizes, man, he has got a net full. And Jesus, I can't help myself. I see him rear back laughing at this moment. Like, you don't even know who I am, son. Even I can call fish out of the sea into the net that you can you can't imagine what I can do. Amen. I'm the God of the holy wild. And all of a sudden, and you know the story. James and John, help! James and John jump in the boat. Come out there to help them. They fill up the boat. Amen. But it hit me the word they. I never I've always thought it was just just Peter. But Jesus was involved in the miracle. And there's not one thing you go through in life that he ain't involved in. He never leaves you alone with the net. He never leaves you alone with the fish. He's always with you. The issue here when I look at it is that there are opportunities. Everybody say opportunity. Here was an opportunity. The word opportunity comes from the word ob porter. It's a Latin word. It means a ship waiting against a port. For it, you know, it's just sitting there, but it's waiting on the tide to come up. And when the tide comes up, see, I was on a great big ship. No, was that? I mean, yeah, 3,500 people on that ship. And it just couldn't park anywhere. It had to wait till the tide was at a good place in order to pull up. And so you're waiting on the tide, and I am as a pastor waiting on, and I feel it. I feel it, Pastor Joseph, among the youth. I feel a tide rising. I feel it among the kids and the adults. I see a tide rise. And when the tide rises, you got an opportunity, amen, a, a porter, amen, to bring the ship into harbor. Opportunities come more than once if you're patient. I've heard people say, well, you just missed an opportunity. Now, if I'm patient, it's going to come again. Opportunities come more than once if we're looking for them. I just got to be looking for them. A lot of times we don't look for opportunity, but I'm going to keep looking for opportunity comes more than once if we constantly knock on the door. I ain't going to give up here. I love the, the Bible talking about a woman. She was a Syrophoenician woman. 
That's a big word. And remember, I am a professional when it comes to words like that. <laughs> a Syrophoenician, she, she, she just kept begging Jesus, heal my daughter, heal my daughter. And, and Jesus finally just gave up and said, okay, she's, she's healed. He said, I've never seen nothing like it. She wouldn't quit. She just kept right on knocking. He mean, she like the like like a dog, you know, just just kept just kept right on. Yeah, she just wasn't going wasn't going to give up. Amen. So at times you must make your own opportunity. You got to make your own. I'm going to make this thing happen here. Amen. I believe Jesus hears us when we get aggressive about the opportunity is not mere chance. Cast the net on the right side. It wasn't by accident. Amen. And opportunities come more than once if we are willing to try other avenues to reach our goal. Now, hear me. I believe how somebody can reach anybody, you got to have you got to be relational. And as a church, we got to start we got to start reaching people. I, I I entitled this message when we're not fishing, we're fighting. Because the truth of the matter is, when we ain't fishing, we are fighting. I've seen churches turn inward and start fighting, start being mean toward one another, amen, and they're not doing nothing on the outside. One of the things I will tell you about the little country church is we're always reaching out, amen. We, we, we ought to be bigger than what we are, but what we are is what we are, okay? But I'm going to tell you something. We've got to constantly keep reaching out, reaching toward people and going after people, not being inside. You get in a boat, a little, little P-Row, huh, a little bitty boat. You know who little P-Row is. That little Louisiana talk for a little canoe. Somebody asked Boudreaux one time, they say, Boudreaux, you know, you know how, do you, do, you, do you have any idea? Amen, because he was bragging about his ability uh, and his knowledge of state capitals. And, and somebody said, well, go ahead. He said, ask me any question. He said, yeah, I know all of them. And the friend said, okay, what's the capital of Wisconsin? Boudreaux said, that's easy, W. So you got these, you, you get a little P row, and all of a sudden you run out of out of out of bait, you're gonna start fighting each other. Amen. In church, the same way. When you're not fishing, you're fighting. So Jesus was teaching these guys how to be fishermen. First, you've got to be relational. Allow the Father's heart to beat in you for the lost. Amen. There are people out there. When I saw the, yesterday, thousands of people in Crosby, thousands of people in this town. And all I thought to myself is all the unchurched believers. I met unchurched believe they don't go to church anywhere. I talk with them. Amen. They used to go to this church, that church, our church, you know. But I talked with I said, oh, my heart broke for them. So you got to be relational. And they didn't condemn, didn't throw no stones, wasn't mad about, just agreed with them. But I just want to be relational first. Then you got to be intentional with people. Amen. You got to have an intent. Go with the intent of seeing people's needs met. Amen. Accept our calling to the Great Commission. When I ask people, what is it that you need? And they tell me, I, I give Again, I didn't, there's no condemnation. I just wanted to hear them. I was intentional, very intentional about what I was doing. And sometimes you got to be a little bit forceful. You got to ask for the Holy Spirit's help. The violent take it by force. In other words, I'm not going to just let that person walk up. I'm going to go over and talk to you. Amen. I'm going to go over and share with you. And then the practicality. God is not calling us to get a bullhorn and stand on a corner and be fanatical. I love the way our tent was set up. We were just serving people, blessing people, waving, throwing candy at people. Some of y'all trying to hit people. Oh. Amen. <laughs> but, but either way, I can tell you that you stand on a corner and start preaching, it is never effective. Never seen it be effective. Nor are we called to win an argument or to browbeat people. A person again, uh, uh, convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Amen. I don't want to win you by, by convincing you one way. I want to love you. Amen. Watch my life and see what happens. Potential. Father's given us the same resources that Jesus had. So we must consider our assets and our assignment. When I look at Peter and James and John, their, their assets, what they had, they had a boat, they had a net, they had an opportunity. That's it. They got a boat and a net and an opportunity. I look at my life. I got a Harley. I got a hot rod and I got an opportunity. Amen. I look at what I got and I use it for the glory of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that, that, that's what's important. So first here, Jesus told him, he said, here's your assignment. From now on, you're going to catch men. It's the same assignment he gave us. From now on, you're going to catch men. What is it that you got? Frank, I spent time with a guy named Fred yesterday that striped the parking lot here. I didn't even know he striped the parking lot. And then he looks at me and he says, Pastor, you don't understand. 20 years ago, 20-something years ago, I came to a church that you pastored, and my life changed. 
And I've been serving God ever since. He said, I had a, a heart bypass. They split. He opened up his shirt. And they split me right here. And when they split me, they, they did all that work in there. And then I started to bleed out. My blood pressure dropped to 15. They had to split me again and go back in there and fix me. He said, I should be dead. But he said, but I'm thankful. And he looked at me and he said, that's why I, I've striped that parking lot for free. Didn't even know the story till yesterday. Thank God. Frank, thank you for connecting Fred back around here doing what you did. First, there's a hesitant obedience. Look at verse 5. He said, Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night. We haven't called anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the net. God's callings are his enablings. You get vision. You get a vision for something. Then there's provision, supervision. You know, I, I look at Tommy here. I look at Mike. You guys are businessmen. I understand that. Mike, I know that you, st you started a business and you developed an, uh, a uh, tool and you patented it. Well, first you had a vision for it. And once you get a vision for it, they got to be provision. Amen. Then they got to be supervision over there. And if you don't get it done right, amen, there's division. Somebody comes in and tries to divide your business or, or what you got going. And then you got to revise it. Revi same way in the church world. Amen. It's just a good little thing to remember right there. I've preached that forever. So our pursuits are fruitless without his blessing on our life. We got to be, but we got to have, I mean, I might be pursuing something, but if I ain't got the blessing of God on me, it, it's not going to help. And I love the fact that Peter, he was hesitant. Man, we worked hard. And many times I think the same, God, I've worked hard. God, you're telling us we fished all night. There ain't no more fish in Crosby to catch. But I'm going to tell you something. Yesterday, I saw the fishes. There were fishes everywhere, fishes on harlots, fishes in hot rods, fishes on floats, fishes walking around with beers in their hand, fishes everywhere. I was excited. Yeah. Amen. I mean, it renewed my vision. So I'm not hesitant on it anymore. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to throw this at you. If you ever hear me talk about stabling the saddle, I always use this right here. Involvement equals stickability. When you get involved in something, you stick to it. I don't care if it's a, a veteran's thing or, 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 or building over here with a bunch of good old boys. Whatever you get involved, you get involved in this house, you stick to this house. Stickability equals stability. The more you stick to something, the more stable you become. You're not wishy-washy. You're not wondering, should I go to church on Sunday? Yeah, I'm going to church on Sunday because I, yeah, I I'm, I'm stuck in that place. Stability results in productivity. There is nothing that makes you feel better than to produce. When you are producing, it feels good, man. When you are getting that money in from working, when you're getting the out of boys and out of girls from working, when you're producing because you're stuck to something, amen, productivity is a wonderful. When you see the results of people coming to Jesus, that's productivity, and productivity equals fulfillment. It just feels right. I'm telling you, this right here is the secrets of abundance. When you've got abundance in your life, God is blessing you. So here in Peter's life, you can imagine when the fish jumped inside that net. How? Oh, amen. At that moment, there was excitement. There was production. Production was equal to fulfillment in his life. He was feeling good, and he was calling James and John over to help him. It was an amazing moment. See, here, here, here's the thing that hits me. There's an honest acknowledgment here. After they get all the fish, you think then at that moment, Peter goes from here to here. He went from excitement to wonder to wow to oh my God. He's God wrapped in flesh. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. He recognized his humanity, his sinfulness, and if Jesus could see all in fish, then he could see inside this heart and see what kind of wickedness is in me, the thoughts I've had, the meanness. I thought, you know, the Bible says, if I thought it, then I did it. If I thought about murder, I did it. If I was lustful, then I did it. If I was resentful, then I did it. You know, that, the, the Scripture adds a really heavy thing on how we think. So i got to be careful with my thought life. But, but just because you thought it don't mean you need to go out and do it. 
But on the flip side, he, he's struggling here. He, in, in the Living Bible, he, he says, I'm too much of a sinner to have around. You ever heard somebody say, I'd come to that church, but the, but the ceiling didn't fall in? <laughs> I hear folks say that. That's the dumbest statement I ever heard. I said, have you seen the people in our church? <laughs> if you come to see the people in our church, you realize you don't, you don't even measure up. <laughs> Keith Sanders goes to this church. <laughs> I see you trying to hide red. Amen. You can't hide from me. And if I call out your name, don't be offended with me. It's just who I am. I just... Amen. use people's names all the time. What I'm trying to do is keep you awake. <laughs> Listen to me. We often desire relief instead of repentance. We often desire relief instead of repentance. In other words, I'd rather walk away from Jesus with a sinful heart depart from me than to repent and get my stuff right. Because if I hang out with this guy, I'm going to have to do right. Because <laughs> he can find a fish. He can see through me. Ah, uh, this man walk, later on will realize he walks on water, that, he, he, that he's a little bit wild. As a matter of fact, I'm a little bit scared of him. I'm scared of you. That's what Peter said. I'm scared of you. Here's our thing. There could be another reason here. You've got to ask yourself, why, why, would Jesus, why would you tell Jesus to depart? We're scared of a wild God. We are. We, a wild God bothers us. The book of Exodus will tell us that. But we scare, We know that if he does something unsolicited for us, he just does it. He heals an eardrum that was ruptured. He takes warts off fingers. Yeah, he does things. We, we, I mean, it kind of blows our mind. He heals our bodies. He gives us a job, amen, and a better job. He, he's doing things in a, a relation. He brings a relationship into our lives that betters us. He removes a relationship that betters us. His next statement to us may be from now on, you're going to catch men or, or come and follow me. We enjoy, listen to your preacher right now. We actually enjoy a safe life. That's why I don't use the word safe. We like a safe life. We like a life that's familiar. It, it can be staked off with boundaries, well trod, packed down, like the children of Israel for 40 years traveling through, uh, amen, trying to get to the promised land, just making loop after loop after loop around Mount Sinai. You know, in life here requires very little discipline. It falls into a neat routine. The church on Sunday, live any way I want during the rest of the week. We know deep down we desire intimacy, friendship with Jesus. So why this love for distance and depart. Listen to me. In the Old Testament, these are still human people. Amen. When the people saw the th human people. <laughs> I've never said that one before. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. God was on top of the mountain. He's shaking it with lightning and thunder. Amen. There's a sound of trumpets, and the people tremble with fear. They stayed at a distance. And they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us, or we'll die. In other words, give us a priest to go through it and get leprosy if he gets. If he get leprosy or if he dies, that's fine. But we, don't, we want to stay far. We, we like God. But we don't love him. We like a little distance from God because, you know, we don't, because we don't know what he's going to do. Amen. So if you just, if you, if you take care of it for us, amen, you know, uh, we appreciate it, Moses. Yeah. Moses goes up on the mountain, come back down with the tablets. Moses ain't afraid to hang out with God. God he got the cloud. Joshua wasn't afraid to hang out with Moses who was hanging out with God. Yeah. Right? You know, so here we got people that are, are fearful of God. And this is the wrong kind of fear. Well, you know, you should, be, you should be reverently fear of God, but you should, Jesus said, come boldly to the throne of grace yeah. that you may find grace to help in the time of need. Don't run from God whenever you see a miracle. Run closer to him. Amen. Get closer to it. Hang out with him. To some, the presence of God holds no comfort. It's only terror. We settle for echoes and rumors and shadows. My brother slid across asphalt when he was a, a young teenager, a boy. Amen. He slid across the asphalt, wrecked a motorcycle. Uh, he said a dog ran out in front of him. He lied to my daddy. Amen. But either way, he wrecked a bike. He's laying up in the hospital. He's wrapped in both arms around his belly. He's tore the skin off of his back and belly and his arms. And I walked in there 
man, and he looked at me, and as I looked at him, I said, Jimmy, you all right? And he said, don't pray for me. <laughs> don't pray for me. Because in his mind, he's thinking that I'm praying and God is kicking his butt. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Hey, man, let me help you. It's the love of God that leads us to repentance. It's how much he loves me that makes me want to repent. It's not that he beat the fire out of me, amen, that I was in a wreck, amen, or that my house caught on fire, amen, or I kept going through floods. I had somebody tell me the other day, man, we went through that flood up at Harvey. Whoo, God loves us, amen. The water came right up to the edge. Of our, I mean, this, ha this other day, the water came right up to the edge of our house. We didn't get flooded. And they looking at me telling me that. I had four foot of water in my house, seven foot of water in one building, 12 foot over the swimming pool, nine buildings flooded from two foot to seven foot. And after they told me that, I looked at them. They said, man, God really loves us. We got water right up to the edge. I looked at them. I said, you know what? Then God really hates me. Yeah. <laughs> Not only did he hate me, he hated, he hated me twice, Joseph. Amen. He got me on 2019 too. He said, you didn't learn your lesson in 2017. I'm going to do it again. Amen. Listen, I never backed up and said God hated me. Never said that. It's just natural things that happen. Amen. Stuff like that happens. I got, I got to keep rolling here, Joe, if you come on up. With that one command, we don't know what's coming next. <laughs> follow me. Forty years ago when I got born again, follow me. Forty some, follow. You just keep following him. You don't know what's next. You ain't got no idea. It, it's spontaneous. I don't, I don't think so. Amen. This guy, Jesus, he's unpredictable. He's absolutely unpredictable. He, he, it's like God is on the loose inside of him. Are you following me? He's, he's on the loose. Amen. He, he turns water to wine. He, he took a boy's side lunch into a banquet. He turned lame men into dancers. Amen. Muddy eyes got vision. God's loose inside this guy. I mean, you can see the disciples sitting around a circle with Jesus, and all of a sudden his eyes get real wide. And all of a sudden, Peter nudges John and goes, Oh, God. Oh, oh God. Here we go again. Something fitting to happen up in here. Hey, man, he's fixing to do something. I just know who he is. Something's going on. And then the third, there was a wonderful promise. For he, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Wow, no fish all night. One obedient move, boom. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners, when Jesus said to Simon, Peter, don't be afraid. Now I'm going to catch me. Don't be afraid. 365 times in the Bible, don't be afraid. The phrase most uh, on the lips of heaven's ambassadors. When, when heaven's ambassadors, the angels from heaven showed up on earth, almost every time they showed up, don't be afraid. You got to keep telling humans over and over from the pulpit to the pew, don't be afraid. Why? Because we keep becoming buck, 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 chicken. A spirit of buck, 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 gets on us. We get scared. We're afraid to make a move. It paralyzes us. Amen. We, don't, we, we, we just shut down. And the angels show up and say, quit. Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. I don't care how big, how mean. I don't care what, how mean she is. You're still going to reach them. Jesus left us with a mission. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Fourth, there was a will and surrender. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and followed him. Who got the fish? Somebody got the fish. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it was the dad got the fish. Amen. And he was happy with the fish. And said, James, I understand now. They're going to follow him. I'll close with this. There's such a peace in your life when you deliberately adjust your life to the will of God. When you, I have a new uh, internet thing out, out at the house and my wife believed it was pointed the wrong way. She said, according to my phone, it's, it, this is that new technology. We got that uh, Starlink, you know what I'm talking about? 
because everything else just don't work. So we, we're trying this, and so far, I'm shocked. It's really good. Uh, not that I'll ever drive a Tesla, but still. So she's got this phone out there, and that phone tells her that that thing's blocked. It's blocked. There's something blocking the signal. So she says, call David. <laughs> He's the one put it up there and have him come over and turn that thing. I said, baby, look, I may be old, but I ain't useless. Give me a ladder. Give me a screwdriver or something. I'll crawl up there and do it. And I did. So I was already sweating from the day anyway. So I got up there and drilled a hole, turned the thing, set the screw, hung out on the ladder, turned that thing into the skies. I deliberately adjusted it. She went inside and she said, oh my, we got such heavy and great signal right now. And this is the thing with that. Your life is so disruptive. You, you don't have, you're so stressed, anxieties. But when I adjust my life to the will of God, all of a sudden, peace, wonderful peace. Cast your net on the right side. I can't follow you. I'm sinful. I know you're sinful, Peter. And I'm still sitting in the boat with you, and I'm still preaching with you in the boat, and I threw the net, and I helped you catch the fish. I was the they in the boat, and I didn't run from you. I knew who you were. Amen. From now on, you're going to catch men. They surrendered their boats and all that stuff, and they followed him. And the history that was made fills the books of the Bible. Amazing story. There, first was a hesitant obedience. We fished all night. Second, there was an honest acknowledgement. Depart from me. Third, there was a wonderful promise. Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch me. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, preached one sermon. 3,000 people came to Jesus. 3,000. Wow. Fourth, there was a willing surrender. They left everything. They followed him. Peter had no idea that one day he'd be locked in jail with John. John, John John's the dude in the Bible where Jesus, where, where Peter came to him and said, how many times should I forgive him? Remember that? Seven times seven? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. He's the guy he's having trouble with. Now they find themselves together and in jail together. I love the Bible. I love this script. I love this. It's so alive. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. I'm going to ask you one question. What is your boat of safety that you keep crawling back to? In other words, what are the excuses to stop you from fishing? What excuses are you using that you need to release? I want you to let it go right now. I don't care if it tries to grab you at the doors as you walk out. of Right now in this building, I want you to release it. I ain't going back to that boat. They left their boat, and they followed him. What is it I need to let go of and follow him? Is it someone? Something? Is it addiction? I'm not asking you to lift your hand. I'm telling everybody in this house, what is that thing? Because God has called us to catch people, to reach people. We're not doing the job we should be doing. I saw thousands yesterday. We got to reach people. Well, pastor, there are other churches in this place. I don't care. That there's not enough churches to reach the people I saw yesterday. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to release all our excuses. Those watching through the internet, help us to release all our excuses and start reaching people for the glory of God. Every addiction, every relation, every, the, if it's financial, whatever it is, God, let us let go of that boat and say, I'm going to follow him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.